let's continue. Y y Yurian. Yeah. I can share the screen myself, right? Sure, you can. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, that's not. I have to do it over here. I think share screen. Oh yeah, there it is. Share. Do you see some PowerPoint with some dudes on a, on a, on the podium? Yeah, but he's very ugly. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. yeah, 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 that's me. Okay, I will, I will, I will continue. Um, as you see in the picture, normally I'm, uh, I'm not using PowerPoints, but uh, for this time I, 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 I made one. Uh, my name is Rini, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm a scientist. Um, which means I like to observe, I like to analyze, I like to see what's there, and I see things once and I find it interesting. If you see it twice, you say, hey, I've seen this before. The third time, I think, hey, this is a new theory or something. Um, so I tend to write about it, do some research about it. And a, a couple of years ago, I, I discovered the business novel uh, because I think um, you always should approach uh, people in their own language, which I find it easy to, to, to read. And, and, and I discovered a business novel, which is for me a very powerful means to, 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 to express a new idea. It started with uh, my, my first book on this, this format, The Power of Scrum, and has been continued. In, in, in a way, I'm, I'm also like to read them. The, the most recent one, thanks to, uh, to, to Jurian on his, his advice, is this one that I bought and, and, and read, The Motive. Uh, I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni's and his way of uh, setting up a business novel, which is two thirds, three quarter of the book is a business novel, uh, lightweight, easy to read. And then in the end, he gives a summary in a kind of a model where he says, well, in fact, the thing I tried to convey looks like this. Um, for the Formula X book, we did something the same. Um, maybe it's a little bit the story behind it is that the publisher came to me with the question if I, uh, uh, if I liked Formula One, I said, well, I like to, to, to watch it in, in, in on the Sundays. Sometimes I fall asleep because it's I have a nice nap. But that's, that's about it. I like it, but I'm not a big fan. But they said, well, we see a market over there. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a book about speed. And then, well, I, I met Jurian. We knew each other. I didn't know about his big hobby and, and a fanship of Formula One. We teamed up and, and the rest is, is, is history. Um, but let's say we did, did think about how to, what's the message? Huh? What, how do we, what do we convey, try to convey in the book? And we came up with a simple model, um, which is we call it the faster, the faster model. And I will spend the next 15, maybe 20 minutes on going through that. I will do it in two parts. First, the, the, the first three of the faster model, and then the, 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 the last three of the faster model with some pole in, 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 in the middle. So uh, let me see if this works. Next slide. Yes. So speed. What 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 was it was it all about? Um, uh, and, and Newton told us that in fact speed is constant, and that's something we tend to 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 forget. Eh? If you don't do anything, an object that has a certain speed continues with this, that speed. Or when it's standing still, if you do nothing, it keeps standing still. So in 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 high school, we 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 are being taught this formula. Eh? The V at times t is the v at time zero plus a times t, where a is the acceleration. So the question is, if you're in an organization where you like to accelerate, where the things need to be faster because your business is moving up because of digitization or whatever reason it is, the question is, what do you actually do? And I see, we see many organizations discuss speed and this says we have to do it faster and our company and our company wants to become faster or our customers want us to, to, to increase the speed of delivering stuff like this. The question I always ask best, 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 back in return comes from this formula. What's your A? What's your acceleration? What are you doing in your organization to actually accelerate? Because if you don't accelerate that we receive from this formula, it doesn't get faster. So that's what we do in the model. We, we explore six dimensions for the A, the, 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 the six dimensions for the acceleration. So this is a summarizing slide. Uh, let's, let's have the first one the, 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 for the fast one, which is focus and clarity, um, which I think is interesting, especially nowadays when we work with, with teams that are more self-managing or self-steering, is the question is, what's their true north? What's their compass? Um, in many Dutch organizations are often invited to come by it. They, 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 they made this transformation. They're working with agile teams. And when I meet the teams or I meet somebody of the teams, I always ask the same question. And the question is, when are you successful? 
Uh, what's your definition of success? And it may not be surprising uh, to you, or maybe it is that let's say my experience is that over 50%, so roughly 60 to 70% of the teams are not able to clarify what their definition of success is. Yeah, well, it's, it's the amount of work they pull from a backlog and get to done in two weeks of time. Well, that doesn't really make me get up in the, in, in the morning. So the question is, when are you successful? And I think it's, it's, it's in the rights of human beings to become successful. But then you also need to know what success is. And the question is, what's this? The basic question you ask yourself all the time. From Formula One, we, we've, we've known, I've learned, I'm working with, 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 with Jurian, is, 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 is the, the, the ultimate question all the time for, for improvements is, does it make the car faster? You know, for any investment we have to do, we can spend millions of do dollars, uh, tens of thousands of hours. The question is always, does it make the car faster? And not the question is, do you think it makes the car faster? Does it make the car faster? So for everything you need to have data, you have to experiment, you have to, to analyze, you have to make sure, does it make the car faster? And the question is, what's this question for your team, for your department, for your organization? What's this one unique question that you ask yourself all the time? What's your car? What's your faster? Uh, so it could be things like uh, how will this increase the NPS or uh, how many casualties will we decrease or how many patients will we cure earlier? Whatever it is, what is your true north? What's your definition of success? And what is the single question you ask your, 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 each other and your people and your, your boss all the time about new ideas? And my experience is in most organizations, there isn't any. Well, if that's not clear what success is, how, you, how can you expect people to really be successful? So that's the first one, focus and clarity. We move to the second one. Oh, yeah, um, this is also maybe interesting for the second one. Yeah, I, I said I hardly work with slides. Uh, one thing I, 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 I often reuse from Steve Denning is what he calls the Copernican revolution in management, which is talking about, do you go for the left side where you say well my firm is the center of the universe and there's a couple of customers circling around me or do i really see the customer as the center of his or my universe where there my firm is circling around it and we can learn from copernicus from the revolution let's say this the latter view uh is most successful and that's why this changes to speed and also the changes to customer centricity or to flexible or responsive organizations is so hard because in most cases it's not about changing ways of working it's not about using a new method no it's a, a whole new way of mindset and looking at things where you let's really take uh, let go of the past where you thought the company is at the core of what we do and you really start to look at the customer at the core of what you do second thing accelerate decisions that's something i really learned from working with Jurian and also learned from from formula one and i and, and if uh, these are this is one of the things that that when you see it you, you can't get rid of it the strange thing in organizations if we talk about decisions if we talk about changing things we act as if they're irreversible we think that if we change something in an organization or in a way of working or in in in, in a method or in a kpi we we pretend whether that decision is irreversible so we discuss about it we take time we have all these kinds of meetings everybody has to say something about it the thing is it makes sense for irreversible decisions however most of them aren't most decisions in companies are reversible so you don't have to take the decision forever uh, in many cases, you never take a decision forever. Even about companies where they're organized, you're just taking decision until the next reorganization, or you're using a new business model until the next one pops along. And this tends to get faster and faster anyway. So once you start to see that most co most decisions are reversible, there is no reason not to experiment. There's no reason to say, well, we don't really know. Let's try it out and see what the data looks. So the acceleration of decision making, which makes you faster, of course, is in many cases in organizations uh, that, that we work in, is treating decisions not as irreversible, but treating most decisions as what they are, reversible decisions, where, of course, it makes sense to say, well, it's the boundary, what's the risk we want to take, how big can the experiment will be, but still they are reversible decisions. And when you let them go and you let them loose and you trust people to act wisely with them, you will see that the learning will happen much more faster. And I think, you know, the learning is in many cases more valuable than the decision itself. So accelerate decision is the number two. 
Uh, one of the th the techniques that can help with that, and I put it here, and I will also put it in the in the handout, is what uh, what comes from management 3.0 is the delegation program. Uh, because there are several kinds of, of decisions, some of them at several levels. And the thing is you have to make this decision with your teams or within your department or with your, with your boss or with your customer. What are decisions your autonomous is taken? What are the ones you consult each other? What is the one where you completely delegate? And I found in practice that this delegation poker or at least the seven levels of delegation are a great way to deal with decision making. It's not black and white. It's not uh, the boss decides or the team decides or the customer. There are uh, several shades of gray and, and, and the delegation poker helps with this. And then it also helps you to make decisions faster because it makes most cases they're reversible. Anyway, the third one, simplify. Um, I, I think we could, we, we, we could work a whole, a, whole, a whole seminar about this. It's about simplification. Um, like Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we see uh, in large organizations is that we've overcomplified things, that we made it more complex uh, and, 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 and making something simple complex is much easier than making something complex simple again. And that's why you see, especially in larger organizations or in established companies, they, they are really have problems with the new kit on the block. Uh, with the small startup company that only has a single app or a single service or whatever it is. Because these guys, they don't have customers, they don't have products, they don't have money. So they have to really be simple and powerful to be, to be successful. So if you really want to become faster, simplification is, is, is the one thing to do. But it's many cases hard because you don't see it yourself. Um, which was the third thing? I have no idea how I'm doing with the timing. That's not too bad. Um, uh, one of the things you could help, of course, is, and I'll also put in the handout, is Gary Hamill's uh, bureaucracy mass index. There's the seven types of bureaucracy you can find in organizations that really make you slow. And you can use them to take away to make things uh, simpler. I think this is the time to um, throw in the polls, Jan. Can you assist sure. with that? Because you of course. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I'll, okay, I'll okay, throw, okay. drop uh, in yeah, the poll. Yeah. So it's time for people to wake up again. <laughs> um, you had a couple of questions prepared. Um, three. Would you like to go over them or just drop yeah, them yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, just prop up, 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 uh, throw them in. Okay. I'm really curious. There you go. Oh, they're all three. Yeah, okay. So the first question I wanted to ask is about personal success. So the question is if you were to look to yourself, um, what are you being measured on? What are you judged on? What's the decision of the people look at your dis success? So is it your presence at work? Uh, or is it the process execution? Uh, or is it the predictability in the work you do? Is it the output that you deliver? Or is it the impact that you give? What, and of course, all five matter, but at the end of the day, if you look at, you know, what is, how am I being evaluated as an individual? How is my success being determined? What one is that? Second question is about the predictability in your work. Um, so how unpredictable is the work that you're doing? Is it very predictable or is it really totally uh, unpredictable and you don't know exactly what's happened? And the, the, the third one is similar, but it's how far can you plan ahead? So to which extent, how far can you reliably plan ahead in your work in your organization? But maybe it's, 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 I can tell a small uh, anecdote in the middle. Um, for the people that, that read the book, uh, we've taken an analogy of a kitchen builder. So we thought about, you know, we have to find an environment that everybody can, we can relate to. So we, we thought about a factory that produces kitchens. And of course, it's, it's obvious it's a, it's a fake story and uh, the guy in, in, in charge starts to make mistakes. And, but the, the thing is that since we've wrote the book, I actually have been approached now three times by, by people uh, wanting to know the address or uh, want to <laughs> check whether this kitchen factory is actually really, really alive. One of them being really, really concrete that they said, you know, I really need the kitchen within two weeks. Can you give me the address of the, the, of the kitchen factory? So and that's the first thing to do is buy the book. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why the in, the, in the third print from now on, in the front matter, we have put the sign that, that, that everything is fictions. It doesn't really relate to any existing companies or people. Or, or we can or, sell an ad, <laughs> some ad space there. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. All right, so 77% voted. I, yeah, so give we should just end the poll and... 
10 seconds. Oh, you, you oh, sorry, I'm too fast. Okay, well, we'll, we'll do it. Let me just share it. the results with you. Um, so let me take a look at it. The first one, yeah, the first one, I think I, I've asked this poll question before, and I think this is really, really interesting. Because what I see in many cases is that the majority of the people actually is this is what they answer. So they say, well, I'm in the end of the day, I'm really judged on impact. Uh, I'm not sure how it is with you, Yuria, but the companies that I visit, it's rarely the case. Well, obviously people value impact, but if you look at what will happen if they don't make the hours, there's another thing present in the system that will pull them into being present for, for the whole day. Um, but my experience, is, let's say, in most organizations I visit, also the ones that have changed, that in the end, people are still being judged, in my case, most of the time at predictability and output. Mm. And yes, there's the story about impact, but you know, but uh, the, 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 I, I think, find it curious. Think, so part of, part of my reflection on that is that very often people don't really necessarily know what is the impact that the organization is looking for, right? So if you're in a team somewhere far away from, from, from the board, you don't really have a lot of awareness of what the strategy is or what are the, what are the highest priorities? What are the, the must win battles, so to say, and you just go to your work and do the task that's in front of you. So I guess that's the sad part of it, but yeah, I mean, people are optimistic, let's, let's, which is let's, also nice. Let's maybe, maybe it's also one thing for after the presentation to really discuss with the group. Uh, how unpredictable is the work in your organization? 50-50, roughly, totally not uh, good, <laughs> and totally yes, I wouldn't expect here, so this is pretty obvious. And you see indeed, let's say, the, 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 the amount of organizations that are able to plan one year or half a year ahead, the majority of that. That's something I would, would really would, would, would expect. I think the impact is interesting because I think it should be fair. It should be the way it is. The, 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 the contradiction in the thing is that when I ask the question to people, most of them, they, 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 I get the answer. The majority says impact. But if I look at the systems that they use in their organizations, it's rarely impact. But let, let's maybe, this is a discussion point. Um, poll is open. Uh, maybe there's some things to formulakitchen.com. Yeah, who knows? I actually own that domain, if I'm correct, or or at least one part of, ah, okay. or the Dutch edition. I'm not sure. So when is when is your your new book book coming? Uh, Wouter asks. Well, you have another book already out there, which you co-authored. Yes, I'm yes, still too we, busy to write another one. Yeah, uh, I, I, um, so, so just recently, I think, how long is it? Two months ago, or something, or a month ago, we released a book on agile transformations, uh, where we, which is not scientific at all. We just looked at uh, with uh, with a couple of colleagues, after doing more than 100 transformations in an organization. Hey, what's emerging over there? How can you change uh, predictably the unpredictable, or how can you plan something like a, a transformation and uh, it's full of anecdotes and stuff like this. At the moment, with some colleagues are writing a book on um, on, on 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 agile work formats, but the the book which is on my mind, you know, which I'm I'm dreaming about and I'm sleeping about and not writing, I'm writing it in my head, is really about um, uh, speed on an organizational level like the, mm. the book on Agile, but then also one on speed and looking at mm. the, the factors that you actually can implement directly to increase the speed. Uh, our book on Formula X is also going that way, but it's also more on a conceptual level with the six dimensions, but really going one level beyond with concrete cases of measures they've taken to really increase the speed. That's, Rini, that's what do you, what do you, yeah. Rini, what do you think about the third one? The third answer in the poll is pretty interesting to me. Um, yeah. the 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 the, the the, 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 the stupid thing about the question that I've, I've composed is, I think the trend is more, is, is interesting. I, I, I've lost the poll, where is it over here? Is, is what do you think it will be in six months from now? Or how, do, how is this going to change in the next years? And, mm. and, and my, my experience, you know, it's, 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 it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And, 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 and that's interesting because we tend to, to be in organizations, you also see the question two, where it's 50-50 predictable. The biggest challenge for us in the coming decades is that we will and we uh, will be in a world where, let's say, predictability is going down, and under the unpredictable is is starting to influence our day-to-day -day business. But most organizations, especially the, the larger ones or the ones that are around for a couple of times, are completely built on predictability. 
And it's not, not, not in just the, the, the methods or in the, the processes, it's throughout, it's in everything they do. If you're predictable, you're good. If it's unpredictable, you're not. The, the, the answer, I don't know, is not being appreciated. So if you want, and, and, and I think the biggest challenge for us for the coming decades, and also a lot of work for us for the coming dec decades, is really to build organizations that are built around unpredictability and are able to deal with that. And a personal challenge, I think, or a personal, how do you call it? Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, for the next years is not only on a organizational level, but also on an individual level. I think we need to completely redesign or reinvent educational systems mm -hmm. in which we teach kids and students to make mistakes. Well, we teach them that it's not the perfect guy who gets an A who makes a great career. It's the one who tries falls on his nose and tries again, is the one you know, who will be successful. And that's mm -hmm. why even in today's world, you see many, many entrepreneurs or people that run large companies being dropouts from school. Why? Well, they've learned it's not about learning stuff in the head and being a perfectionist. It's about learning by doing. So I think the next generations will need to prepare for that. Mm, so yeah. that's 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 my personal quest. I was looking for the word quest uh, for for the coming years. But let's say the unpredictable in organizations that expect predictability. I think that's something we will be working on for a couple of years. Let's yeah, move back to the faster model. Yeah, and hopefully, like what Isabel is pointing out. Um, the pandemic is obviously a good example. Like, how is your yearly budget going right now? Right? Are you still sticking to the plan that you made uh, four months ago, or are, are you really throwing it out of the window and, and being quick on your feet? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so yeah. 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 And the the, the 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 pandemic is also interesting for for two sides. One of the things I I find it really interesting that we've done these agile transformations. We're trying to meet big companies more responsive and more agile and stuff like this. And 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 now is the lakmus proof. I'm not sure the, the what what is the English <laughs> word. The proof this of the pudding. The, the, this is the proof of the pudding. I mean, you know, what's happening now? And, 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 and are you responsive in, in, in a way? And how do you respond? And do you respond because of an opportunity or because things change? And do you approach with a positive behavior? Or is this just, are you being afraid? And are you going to, to, to fall back on old habits? And I think that's that's a big challenge. But I think it's it's part of our, I've, I've, I've done a webinar last week with a, a organizational psychologist, uh, Anjuma Rijke. And she said, you know, what you can see in these phases, especially in the, the early weeks of the pandemic, is really lizard brain behavior. Mm. It's, 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 it's fight, freeze, or, or, or run. Yep. And you see exactly these three core responses in many organizations. They, they, they either ignore the thing that's happening and just wait to pass by, or they, they're using the old trick of cutting costs, or the third one saying, well, there's, there's a big opportunity here. How can we contribute mm. and what's the new chances? Let, let's move back to the presentation. Yep. Four, faster model. Team engagement. Um, one thing, you know, I, you, you really appreciate, and, and maybe this is a side story, is that um, in the novelish, in the business novel part of Formula X, we, uh, there's this, this, this hat person who is stuck and he gets his inspiration by visiting F1 as a VIP guest. Um, so we wrote a book. We wrote a manuscript, Yuri and I, and I looked at each other and said, well, have you ever been as a VIP guest to the Formula One? Well, no, I didn't, no, I wasn't. So maybe what the story wrote is completely bollocks. So let's see if we can test this. So we, 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 we dug up a lot of money and we thought it was enough, but we needed to add some little more. So the two of us went as a VIP, we, we had to buy the VIP tickets and we went to the Barcelona race uh, 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 last year made some uh, some videos over there. But one thing that I really, and I think for this, this was the point of time where it really, F1 hit my heart, is you saw and actually you felt and you sensed the team spirit everywhere. It was amazing. It was in, it, it, it was in the celebrations after the race. In our case, Max qualified fourth, and then he, he made it to the podium. He, he he actually got to third place. But also, we had to do. We were able to do these pit walks where we visited the teams, and I think you know it's it's you sense the teamness and the ownership everywhere. And that that was the point in time where I really F1. You know, really, really I fell in love a little bit, and it it hit it hit me hit me deep. And uh, one of the things, if you talk about team engagement, what I really in, uh, like is two things on the, on the content side. One of them I will go through a little bit quickly. 
which is this model by a colleague of mine, Peter Peter Koning. He makes, let's say, uh, he helps team develop in their ownership. I will put in the, 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 some background material in the handout. Oh, and the, the other thing, and then maybe let's 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 discuss it now because I, I wanted to do something else. Um, but one of the things I've noticed is that we treat teams as they are all the same. Or if we want to make them self-managing, we just expect them to be self-managing from one day to the other, or in a, in a split second. And what 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 Peter Koning taught me is that let's say if the maturity of the team and the freedom they get is not imbalanced, you get um, ineffective or even destructive behavior. And the thing is, which was for me interesting, is that when you have a low mature team and they have too much freedom. What you actually see, what's on the surface of that team, is completely identical uh, to a team which is very mature and which does not get enough freedom. Um, it's 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 nothing gets out of it. People get stressed. There's um, there's retention. There is um, um, objection. There's there's lots of, lots of energy, and you, you see all the bad things happening. And the the, the core response of most leaders, if, if teams are not functioning well, they think, well, apparently they have too much freedom. And I think one of the things that I, I, I use, that's why I use it with leadership teams as well, is that if you observe ineffective teams, uh, ask yourself whether it's too much freedom or may it be that these guys are just too professional, have good enough experience, that there's just not enough freedom. They cannot be successful. And if you cannot be successful because there's not enough autonomy, well, wh 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 why try? So I think, you know, that's one of the things that, 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 that helped me. Um, the fifth element of the, the, the faster model is elementary physics. Um, I started off with the, the, the core formula of, uh, of, of, of speed. Um, let me see, yeah. Um, one of the things which is really interesting is this model. I, 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 I tend to write on flip charts, so I made one flip in this presentation, is the, 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 the second law of Newton, which is F is M times A. So it's force is mass times acceleration. If you rewrite the formula, it says acceleration is force divided by mass. And I think this is really interesting. And why? Well, maybe maybe to clarify the formula again, if you look lower, I tr what I try to draw over there is a grocery cart. So you go to the supermarket and you put your, your groceries in, 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 in the cart. Well, and we all know if you want to have the, the, the cart accelerate, which is the A in the, in the picture, you have to push the handlebar with a certain force. And we also know, you know, that the, the more mass the cart has, the harder you have to push. So, in fact, that's second law of Newton's. Huh? So I always inv thought about why Newton took so long. My theory is that there were no supermarkets in, uh, in, 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 in its, its time of day. In 1687, those supermarkets so it took a little bit longer. But if you go back to the formula, uh, if acceleration is force divided by mass. You can see what we've been doing in the past decades in organization. If we wanted to go faster, we added force. Uh, bigger machines, more people, uh, bigger computer power, uh, uh, a larger engine, whatever we try to do if we wanted to accelerate, we try to ex increase the force. But as you can see from the formula, there is an other way to increase uh, uh, the acceleration and it's keeping force constant, but also lowering mass. And I think that the, the, the challenges or the opportunities for organizations in the coming decades lies exactly there. Decreasing mass, more digitization, which hasn't, that doesn't have mass, smaller teams has lower mass, a, a, a smaller focus, simplicity, because it's lower mass. So if you if you are able to shrink on the mass level, you can keep the force the same and still accelerate. That's I think the, the thing about about Newton's law. And, and the second thing, of course, there's another law in 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 in, in physics that you can reuse. That's the the uh, that's from Einstein. And and I always try to clarify this with a with a, with a story. Uh, Suppose you're walking through in India in the eastern part of the northeastern part of India. You're walking through the through the the forest, and you run into a tiger. Well, if you walk into a tiger, you have a big problem because the the, the tiger is hungry, and he really likes you. Uh, he's he, he thinks well, this is a nice a nice bite. And then the question is always, how fast should you run to survive? And most people they think well, you need to to climb with a tree or something. 
it's not correct because you know tigers can climb some would think you have to be faster than the tiger well that's also not possible because tigers are pretty fast now the, the real answer to, to the question is you have to just run a little bit faster than the person next to you speed is relative uh, and that's also you don't need to be the fastest one in the, the whole world you just need to be a little bit faster than your competitor and sometimes that can be a little bit faster than your customer or it can be a little bit faster uh, than the other colleague or a little bit faster than the other team so speed is relative and like in formula one it's not that you have the ultimate speed you just have to be a millisecond faster than the other team in order to win um finally let's go to six rhythmic learning and and that that's one of the things um which really struck me in, in, in and Jurian also clarified this a little bit, you know, the, the debrief of the race lasts longer than the race itself. Uh, during the weekend, there is a, this, this tens of learning points and a learning rhythm in there. Um, I think, you know, what we could, could take over from, from, from Formula One um, is this cadence in learning and really the rhythm in learning. In fact, putting the learning a more, important than the actual result. And I think that's, 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 that's something that struck me when doing this research and working with Jurian on the book is that I always thought that a Formula One team or a Formula One driver wanted to, to win the race. And of course they want to win the race, but they just want to make the fastest lap. And they don't want to make the fastest lap because they want to make this, because they know that when we try to make the fastest lap now, we will get the data and get the learning to make it even faster in the next round. And it's even for each curve, a curve, each turn in the circuit. They try to run it on the edge to know because on that edge lies the knowledge and lies the data to learn how to make the turn a little bit faster the next time. And why do I find this so inspiring? Well, I find it so inspiring because the companies I visit, the teams I work with, the, 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 the board of directors that, that, that I, they're being asked, I'm asked to challenge them, is how often do you really race on the edge? How do, to which extent are you actually trying to find that edge because that's where the knowledge lies to really push the, bur uh, the, the border and really to gain the knowledge to go even faster? Or are you trying to be safe? But if you try to be safe, there's actually not going to be the learning to go faster. And I think this is a really interesting thing to say, well, uh, we just try to win races and the, winning the race is a, a by effect, is a side effect from trying to be the fastest and the best learners. And I think we can take this. And I think we also can bring this to the teams we work with, the agile teams that saying, well, we want to learn how the next sprint can be better. And the best way to learn how to make the next sprint better is actually delivering a piece of product that's valuable to our customers. One of the final things in the slides is the research one of the research that was the Aristotle product project and most people uh, present probably have heard about it. If you haven't, it's really interesting uh, material. What they did, they really, they went into Google and they uh, looked at a bunch of teams and trying to find out which factors make a team uh, hyper productive. And all the hypothesis they got, they could throw out of the window. And what in the end remained is that there, there's five factors, but the first one is very, very, very dominant and that's psychological safety. If people are, not feeling safe, they won't take risks. And I think that's also what we've sensed when we were at the racetrack, uh, Jurian. When we visited the teams and we saw the engineers work, nobody was afraid. They were taking the risk and they will know that if they make a mistake, they won't be blamed for it, but it will be treated as a learning opportunity uh, because everybody's trying their best to go faster. And I think, you know, if we want to prepare organization for the next decades, where we want to need to make them faster because our society speeding up, I think the number one to think to, f to focus on is psychological safety, uh, making people feel safe. And again, in organizations that expect predictability, psychological safety tends to be low. So this is the area where the, the, the most interesting challenges and opportunities lie, lie for us. So wrapping up, speed doesn't change by itself. Hey, you need to accelerate. That's why we have the faster model. In fact, the six dimensions, maybe you've noticed also sum up to the word faster, focus and clarity, accelerate decisions, simplify, team engagement, elementary physics and rhythmic learning. Um, but to close off, I'm from Delft University. And if you go to Delft, people always gave these Delft blue tiles and they have a saying on it. So I would to end up with a saying like this. And I stole it from Mario Andretti. 
one of the famous Formula One drivers says, if everything seems under control in your organization, you're just not going fast enough. Thank you. Awesome. It's actually also the first, the first sentence in the book. Um, yes. And it's, it's yes. a great one. Robert, Pedro, and I, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, I had an unfair advantage because I had read the book uh, already. And uh, I was able to relate to other books like The Goal and the, the fictional stories that it is. The story is really well written, uh, but I felt that it was kind of lean centric. It was very manufacturing centric. I would have preferred the story to be more knowledge work centric because the knowledge work discovery and design can be inspected and adapted very, very quickly, right? There's nothing static in knowledge work. There's no, there's no flow, flows of a different kind. So that was, I think if I present the book to a lot of leaders, they would still think in a mechanical mindset because they're used to the steps, they're used to people following a production line, right? That's the metaphor that most of these organizations are used to. So I had, I had some challenges with that. Mm, yeah. Was, yeah, the bigger challenge would me, be for me is that it's, this was a good happy ending. Uh, the the director there, he figures it out and he does all the things. Don't, right? don't spoil reality, it, don't spoil it. <laughs> yes. the, the, the messy realities that we see in actual organizations are very, very difficult. You know, there are, there are hardly any leaders who have that big thinking and say, hey, I want to figure out how to engage my people and I want to be humanistic. That, that philosophy yep. is totally lacking. So the big question that I and probably all of you are struggling with is that how do we get people to want it? Just be humans. That, that's the big bridge to cross. Yeah, it's a good one. If people want to respond, go ahead, right? I mean, um, if you want anybody wants to share. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, that's a really valid point. There's a lot of discussion now about being human. <laughs> and um, yeah. you'd have thought that everybody knew what that meant. But actually, um, maybe people don't know what being human actually means. Um, people talk about empathy and uh, many people imagine that's just being nice, but actually it's a bit more than that. Um, so it's a really uh, good point that you read going forward. Being human is going to be even more important than, uh, than, than ever before. Um, the whole thing about the knowledge economy, um, and, I know, and I don't just mean about cognitive development, I also mean about emotional development. Um, the one thing that comes across from your presentation, which is very good, by the way, so thank you both, uh, Reedy and Nuri, and very enjoyable. Um, it's really about um, what you touched upon when you were talking about sensing and almost um, being able to touch the team spirit. Mm -hmm. um, that means that they are so tightly knit. They know each other so well. And it's something that Isabel had raised about trust. They um, are prepared to be vulnerable. They're prepared to make mistakes. They are prepared to um, be criticized or whatever it shall be. And, and you know, in, in essence, um, we were saying in our group, it's about human progress. It's about human creativity. It's about that critical thinking. It's about what is best in humanity. Um, and if only organizations would unleash the power within, as you know, to quote a famous author, as you all know, I'm sure, but it is about unleashing the power within and, um, and, it's, and not being afraid to do that. And that means accepting failure or mm. learning. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Well, I want to go off of that a little bit because I was in a group with Maria, Emily, and Isabel, and we, she met, Isabel mentioned trust, and that one definitely stuck with me the most. Um, so I worked for a nonprofit association, two of them for the last 15 years, and I just moved to the consulting side two months ago. My, I spent one week in the office, one week and a half, a week and a half, and then they shut down the office and were like, on board remotely, right? right. <laughs> so I, I, trust has been lingering. At my previous association, um, there was a lack of trust specifically on remote work, which is kind of funny right now. Um, there was a notion that you needed to be around, to be present, to make it seem as if, you know, um, you were contributing for whatever reason. That was a leadership decision. Uh, they let us do, I was a department head, they let us determine the amount of trust we would give to our teams individually. So I had the most flexible um, uh, 
remote work policy. I ran the digital team, uh, but not everybody had the same thing. So I'm just curious as all of these organizations have sort of shifted into, you have to trust people because you can't see them uh, in person anymore. Um, like repairing that trust, especially if this is the permanent thing, the more permanent um, uh, work situation. What are some ways to, um, I don't know, sort of fast pivot into, okay, I know we didn't trust you before, but now we have no reason but to trust you remotely. Uh, instead of trying to advise people to cut their cameras on and leave them on throughout the entire day, which I've read and I'm, I'm horrified by. Uh, what are some ways to that we can help either our own organizations or advising other organizations of how to repair that trust and establish that? If, if I may jump on that one, Tim, uh, what I find really interesting at the moment is what I also started off at the beginning is this is the, the, the proof of the pudding at the moment. And I see, you know, I see two types of organizations that we've guided in the past years and that they implemented new ways of working. In my case, they, we call it agile, but we can call it differently. Um, is that, is there result orientation or not? So companies that have really adopted that one and, and, and let's say they have impact folks, they know what their definition of success is and they work, work short cyclic to deliver that success. In fact, it doesn't really matter that people are working from home. I mean, you know, their biggest problem is not getting the people to work now they're not here. Their biggest worry they have now is what will happen when the, 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 the pandemic is over and people don't want to come, in, come into the office. How do we get them back on board? And it doesn't mean they have to be in office all the time, but that, that, that's one of the challenges. The other things are the ones that just painted, painted the walls with a new way of working. And then I find out now when people are working at home that there isn't result orientations and they are not delivering success in short cycles. Those are the ones that struggle hard. So, but in both cases, I think it's great because we now have surface on the surface. We are very visible whether it's working or it's not 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 working so the, for me the result orientation or the definition of success is, is is the core thing to me but i'm not sure what the others think about this yeah maybe we can also hear from one of the other groups so well, that was another if one I could just reflect on the conversation just now sure um for me it's not it's not whether you are asked or as a team decide to have your camera on all day it's why the camera should be on. So just the motivation or the intention, because I've talked to a more developed uh, organization and they said, we discovered that if we keep our camera on during the day or for two or three hours and we, and we just have the camera on and it's just having the presence, it's really good for team morale. So uh, it's not about why or the camera is on. So, uh, usually we share like method methodology or processes. It's good to have the camera on or it's bad to have the camera on. No, it's the intention. It's the why. It's the hard conversation. Uh, that's what's yeah. how. For me to build on that, it's also about making a deliberate choice as a team that that is what you want instead of it being imposed as a rule. Um, right. So if you as a team decide that that's how you want to work, well, that's great. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's all about choice. And participation and I think what what was also talked about is the rise of spy software right now right this is kind of the the thing that's horrific but yeah thanks for sharing that and I guess we, we need to become very deliberate with everything right now because the old thing is just not really working anymore you just cannot tap some somebody on the on the shoulder and you also cannot be in eight hour video calls all, all day I mean I know a lot of managers currently still do that right they just inherited their own meeting rhythm and they're exhausted at the end of the week so it's really an opportunity to rethink um, the way we're doing meetings, the way we share information, uh, the way we communicate with each other and leverage some of the modern tools to do that. So we're getting close so to hope, our end. You, hope that there you, have, you hope that there will be a lot of reflections done in the organizations like properly, not just going back to normal that used to be normal. So yeah, I really hope yeah. that the learning is taken care, taken care of after this. Yeah, one one thing that you, I, I, that I, I I've seen I've seen in the last years and I still seen it in the last weeks is, of course you cannot change everything yourself. And I mean when we talk about leadership and we talk about other people, most of the time we're talking about ourselves, but sometimes we're not. And and in Dutch we 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 have a saying that says. Um, 
Uh, dan moet de schip het wal markeren. Uh, de wal het schip markeren. I think it's in English something. If it doesn't work uh, the one way or the other, then maybe the, the shore has to turn the ship. Right. And I think that that's 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 that, 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 that's what what happens. I mean, you know, I have seen so many organizations where the leadership, let's say, is too much looking on predictability, not able to deal with this. And I mean, they can they they can do A, they can fire B, but in the end, they are the next ones. And I've always seen the people that are being replaced now because they're not able to deal with the uncertain world. They're re being replaced by managers or directors who are able to deal with unpredictability and that have the trust mindset and they are open to putting the power to the people and stuff like that. So I'm very, but maybe I'm a little bit too positive uh, mindset myself always, but I think, you know, time will solve this uh, 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 one way or the other, but it will be solved. So you, you choose your your battles in your organization, but, 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 but in time, you know, it will be fixed. That's, that's at least keeps me uh trying because i know it, it, it uh, the solution is already there it's coming yeah. towards us in time we only have to wait for it to become the, but it, it'll it, it'll arrive I'm, I'm pretty sure because the alternative doesn't work yeah so, so um yeah um so i because we're so close to the end time um i'm i would just just want to share some uh uh, a sh you know, I'm going to share just a kind of a nice final slide and also reminding everyone that you can stick around. Um, so if you want to stay, that's totally fine. But I've, al I've also liked to, the promise of the time box. So we promise to end close to this time. So yeah, for everyone, thanks so much for, for, for being with us. And um, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, here are our contact details. We'll share the slides. We'll share all the other information and also the recording. And um, yeah, now go change something is my encouragement. Um, it's nice to be inspired, but it's uh, nicer if you actually make some change. <laughs>